As I said a few moments ago, I have been fascinated by this idea of the fear of the Lord for a long time. I read the Bible, both for myself and as part of my job, and the fear of the Lord is all over the place. Fearfulness is clearly a significant attribute of the God that is revealed in Scripture. We've heard from Isaiah about the Messiah, where he shall delight in the fear of the Lord, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the fear of the Lord. In the psalm, we heard that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and that the Lord delights in those who fear him. And yet, in all the New England congregational churches that I've served, everyone in those church, churches would insist that the fear of the Lord is a part of the old, mean, vengeful, arbitrary, Puritan God of our Puritan ancestors who's dead and buried and good riddance. And that this idea of a fearful God must be a fear-based faith, sort of a keep your heads down and do what you're told and believe blindly faith. And that's not who we are as people of God. So we never talk about this aspect of God. So. I started to do some research into this, and in Hebrew, it's called Yirat Adonai. And I learned that it's not fear in the one sense that we know it. It's both a numinous awe kind of fear, like being afraid of heights, or being afraid of the dark, or being obedient out of fear, like fear of someone who's scary. But following this further, the delight that the Messiah will experience in regard to this fear is a word that also means to be enlarged, to breathe freely, to have ample room, be refreshed, revived. And it comes from the same Hebrew word as ruach, which is spirit or breath. So this fear idea is not meant to be either constricting or compelling, but rather expansive and liberating. The rabbis have much to say about Yirat Adonai. Fear, awe, being overwhelmed by a reality greater than oneself and greater than that we think we encounter in everyday life. And for the rabbis, this fear is living life with a trembling awareness of the divine presence, not only all around us, but within each of us, all the time. And they use words like wonder and amazement and admiration and majesty, all words that we also don't tend to use very much. Which is exactly why I find this idea of the fear of the Lord so fascinating. Because to be honest with you, that's exactly what I want my God to do and be in my life, to expand me and to liberate me, to fascinate me and fill me with awe and wonder and admiration. Because frankly, I always suspected that we in the progressive church were wrong to distance ourselves from this idea of the fear of God because we're missing out on something important. Because you can't honestly strip God of God's awesomeness, which is what makes God, God. Strip God of power and of presence, the things that make you just gasp and delight and wonder. Because if you do, what are you left with? Sort of a teddy bear that you take out on Sunday morning for an hour to cuddle with, and that's not gonna get you very far in life. But to have a grown-up God for grown-ups, that's what spirituality is about, I think. And this fear of the Lord is right there in the middle of it. What it would be like to be a fearful of the Lord kind of person. And so, as I reflected back this week on this experience and on my journals over the years and the times when I experienced this most directly, I pulled out a few vignettes that I wanted to share with you. Not to show to you in a bragging sort of way 
what a spiritually mature person I am, but to point out to you that you have probably been exactly what I, where I'm talking about, but we're just thinking it was a different kind of experience. So the first one was at the end of a very long night. I've been helping out, and my wife and I were both exhausted, but exhilarated because there was a new baby. And so I leant, leant over and gave her a kiss goodbye because I still had to go to work. And she was absolutely beautiful and exhausted, but fulfilled with this new baby. And I can remember like it was yesterday as I walked out of that hospital door, and it was absolutely sweltering summer heat, Connecticut River Valley heat. And the wind was blowing on my face, and I could hear the birds singing because it was still like five in the morning. And I thought, I just stepped off into the beginning of the rest of my life. A new life of infinite possibilities. How do I know what that child will do and what it's going to be like? And it was this exceptionally intimate experience of just me and my wife and our kid. And, but I realized that it was a universal experience that everyone from the beginning of time knew exactly what that was like. And I feared because I just, too much emotion. Just last year, it was another long night of sitting visual and I'm exhausted again. And I'm filled with the enormity of what's just happened. I've just watched the Ruach, the spirit and breath, sigh out of my mother for the last time. And she's no longer there in her body. So I kiss her goodbye and I let go of her hand, which I've been holding, because it's time to go. And I say goodbye. And this time I can also distinctly remember if you've been down in the hospital district in Boston with all the towers. It was February. I stepped out that door and it's like a wind tunnel. And this freezing cold breeze, breath, breeze comes into my face. It's bracing. And it's like a wake up and I think, I'm going to miss her because I love her and I know she loved me. And we had a great life together. And while her body may be dead, I know her spirit is alive. And once again, that sense of, oh my God, my mother, how much more intimate does it get? And yet every person who ever has been born knows exactly what that is. And the fear of the Lord, to have God give us this gift of people to lay to rest. <clears throat> On the other side of the world, one evening I'm walking home from the swimming pool in Reykjavik at night. And as I'm walking along, the skies open up in a complete arc from right to left, as far as you can see, of swirling chartreuse and fluorescence, purples and reds and yellows and blues. And even though I've seen it before, can't take it for granted. I have to stop and watch. And I'm all alone, so I don't have to say anything to anyone. Right? Like, ooh, look at, or get my phone out. Actually, they didn't even have phones then <laughs> in your pocket. I would have to run home to get my phone. Or not my phone. My, my, I couldn't, I'd have to unplug my phone and it wouldn't have worked as a camera. But what could I say except, wow, or, oh my God. And I think the same thing. I'm alone seeing this, completely intimate, and yet since the beginning of time, people have been looking up into the night sky in wonder and touched by just the magnificence of it. The fear of the Lord. And not to overdo the whole nature thing, but a few years ago, I was sailing down east to Bar Harbor out of Marblehead. And it was nighttime, and it was my turn to take the watch. Everyone else had tucked in. 
And we'd left the uh, glow of Portland astern, and the whole cosmos opened up. See it, clear as day, no light pollution at all. Following wind, autopilot was on, there really wasn't much to do. And then I heard this sound of a breath, a deep breath, and it was a whale. And then there was another one around the boat. I couldn't see them in the dark. I could smell them, and I could hear them breathing. And I knew that they're not a fish. They're a mammal just like me, and I'm not alone out here in this vastness, this darkness, where I can't see anything or anyone. And I thought, how intimate, me and these whales, and yet from the beginning of time, as long as people have set sail on the ocean, have felt that affinity and that wonder. We're on yet another part of the world. I'm standing in the dark, mud, rutted streets of Fond de Blanc in Haiti, or I'm down at the Pine Street Inn in Boston, or someplace else where there's a lot of misery, human misery. And all around me is humanity. Humanity wearing rags, humanity with no money, humanity with no jobs, humanity with no housing, humanity in bad health, humanity with no prospect, Humanity with no deodorant. And there is certainly a fair amount of sadness and darkness and even madness. And yet, what I remember is not that, but the laughter and the joy and the smiles and the warm greetings and the handshakes. Sometimes more warmth than I've had at family holidays or church fellowship. And it sweeps over me in these places that these people who I've never seen before and may not see again are truly my sisters and brothers. And that I'm not alone. That I'm part of something called the children of God. And that it is in serving my neighbors that I find life. And that life is a gift that's meant to be given away. And that all the other cliches are only cliches until you live them, and then they're truth. And so very intimate, I'm having this experience, and yet everyone who's been where I was, universal experience, the fear of the Lord, me and them, no different. So I have a lot of these experiences, and I'm sure you do too. But what I have discovered is that once I started to look for it, I noticed it, whereas before I hadn't. And it's all around me right here and within me. So now I can make pancakes for my kids in the morning, and it's there, because I remember having pancakes with my grandmother and my mother. Or I stop on my work and watch a red-headed woodpecker peck on a tree, and I marvel at that, at the colors. Or I walk into our house and I smell home. No place else smells like it. We're just sitting here in church and breathing and being alive. And I realize that the wisdom is to stop taking myself so seriously and the things I think so seriously, seriously and just try to notice the holiness, the divine presence in everything, everywhere, right now. And what I've discovered is that this fear of the Lord, when it fills me, I don't fear anything else. Fearing God enough that you need not fear anything else. Because, my friends, if you haven't noticed it, let me tell you, we live in a fear-based world. Our politicians are trying to scare us. Our economists are trying to scare us. 
Our military leaders are trying to scare us. Our scientists are trying to scare us. Our neighbors are trying to scare us. Everyone's trying to scare us. It's essential to remember the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear. And when you're afraid, you can't possibly see the love. That, my friends, I think is the fear of the Lord. Amen. We're going to um, pray and receive our offering now.